Good morning, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with a post night shift emergency department uh, COVID update. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm board certified in emergency medicine and obesity medicine. I work um, in an emergency department just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. I also run a functional medicine clinic in Charlotte. Um, I've been posting updates uh, from my perspective, sort of on the front lines as an emergency doctor from the beginning. And uh, I'm continuing to do that. I'm in a, sh a string of three night shifts in a row. So I'll try to give you guys updates each day. Uh, last night was, uh, again, long night. First night's always a little, little hard to get into. I was dreading coming in because if you look at when the dates are like Christmas and New Year's, we're starting to get all those cases in. Last night was not as bad as I anticipated. Sometimes it's good to kind of be really worried about getting getting crushed and coming in and being a little bit less than, than you, you're worried about. I think we were only, when I got here, only boarding 19 patients in the emergency department. Now that's funny because we normally never board patients in the emergency department. And 19 is now, in my mind, like a good good night. Um, still seeing lots and lots of COVID. About 40% of the patients I saw last night were COVID related. Um, that's quite a big percentage. A fair number of, of sick ones, a couple ICU admissions. A lot of younger people between mid 20s to sort of 50 year old in that range. Um, luckily, most of those people, you know, were, were okay to go home, so that's good. I usually talk about numbers, and numbers, you know, are going up and up and up. 22 million cases so far in the U.S. Uh, yesterday, we had 283,000 new cases. I think that's a record. Uh, we had 3,465 deaths, and um, those numbers, that's not a record. I think the record was over 4,000 the day before, so a little bit down yesterday. Our case positivity rate in the country is 14%. You know, it needs to probably be below 2% for us to be okay, and it's at 14%. Now, I'm going to start talking about some vaccine numbers. Worldwide, we've vaccinated 23.5 million people, and in the U.S., 6.7 million um, vaccinations. You know, I posted an update on the 6th, and I, I thought I would talk about a little bit about that because there was a woman that, that posted a, a lot of sort of all-in-one sort of a, a bunch of conspiracy theories and basically untruths about about the vex about vaccines, about the virus, about all kinds of stuff. And I thought we'd been gotten past this, but apparently, you know, there are, and I still get messages along this sort of bent. And I thought what I would do, if you want to, I, I, I got a little punchy. It was late at night and I, I started responding to this person. And I don't usually get into internet battles with people, but the, 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 what she was saying is so patently wrong. I, I felt like I had to respond. And I thought I'd go through some of her points because, you know, I realized that, you know, just because I, I'm, dealing with this all the time probably most people don't and maybe i need to be a little bit less cavalier and and you know kind of put myself in other people's shoes because some of the stuff i can see if you're uneducated you probably it might sound real so i thought i would go through some of the points that she raised and my, sort of my response to them the first thing she talked about was the fact that there's antifreeze in the vaccine because it has polyethylene glycol that kind of stabilize it with cold temperatures um and there is a, an ingredient in antifreeze that's very deadly called ethylene glycol. Um, ethylene glycol is a, you know, it, it's an emergency medicine thing. We, we, it's one of the things we're trained to treat because it can kill you. Four ounces will kill a full grown man. Very, very deadly. However, ethylene glycol is not polyethylene glycol. They're derived from each other, but polyethylene glycol is a benign substance. It can't hurt you. It's actually in a, sub, in, a, in a medicine called Miralax, which many of us have taken. It's a laxative that we actually give to kids. You use it before colonoscopies. The amount that you take is a whole shot glass full. The amount of polyethylene glycol in the in the virus, you know, it's like point, I don't know, the volume of the, of the, vac or the vaccine rather is microscopic. Um, it absolutely cannot help you. It's one of these things where the words kind of sound the same, but they're not. And if you look at the comments that I put down in the sixth, I've got links to show you that they're not, they're completely not the same thing. Polyethylene glycol is completely safe. We use it all the time. Um, so there's no antifreeze in the vaccine. Uh, the other thing was that she said that mRNA vaccines change your DNA. Well, 
you know, I don't want to get into a big genetics uh, um, lesson here, but basically that's impossible. mRNA is essentially an instruction. It goes into the cytoplasm to the ribosomes, and ribosomes are area in the cell that produce, basically produce proteins. And so what we're doing with an mRNA vaccine is we're sending in instructions to the cell, to the cytoplasm of the cell, to produce these proteins. It doesn't go to the nucleus where the DNA is. That's not what it's acting on. And normally mRNA copies something from DNA and then takes it and transports it to ribosomes to get produced. mRNA never changes DNA. So it cannot change your DNA. And this particular vaccine doesn't go there. The other thing is that that mRNA that we're using is very short lived. So when you get that vaccine, either the Pfizer or the Moderna one, it's only in your system for about 36 hours, maybe a little bit longer than it's gone. What it causes you to do is to not produce the virus, so you can't catch COVID from the vaccine. That was another thing that was brought up. It produces just a tiny piece of the virus, the spike protein that the virus uses to attach the cell. And so the idea is that you build the, you have the cells produce this foreign protein, the body notices it's foreign, may, has an immune response to it, and you produce antibodies against it, and also you, you develop some memory about it. So the first time you get exposed to a new antigen that you're going to have a reaction to, it's relatively mild. And that's why most people are having pretty mild symptoms from the first vaccine. I think when, you, when people start getting the second vaccine, you're going to have more symptoms. And now, these are not side effects of the vaccine. These are our indications that your immune system is working. And those things are like fevers, chills, body aches, fatigue. Those are things that if, if you experience are, are not caused by the virus, they're caused by the antigen in your body's, or rather the antigen that's being produced in the ribosome. So the spike protein is the antigen. Your body is going to produce immune system, uh, is gonna respond to that. And so it's very likely a lot of people when they get their second one are gonna get sort of body aches and things. And honestly, I mean, I've had my first immunization, no problems. If I get some body aches after the second one, it will be reassuring to me because I'll know that my body's responding to it and I'm making an immune response. So, um, you know, in terms of adverse, you know, this particular person says we're, we're, guinea, we're feeding people like guinea pigs. Well, remember, we've had 6.7 million vaccines given out so far, you know, mostly to healthcare providers. So, um, you know, I don't think we've suddenly poisoned every doctor and nurse and PA and respiratory therapist. Um, you know, there have been some adverse react reactions. There's a, a national database. And right now, I think that they've had... Um, 139 what are considered serious reactions. That's, those are probably more anaphylaxis, severe allergic reactions. Um, out of 6.7 million um, vaccine doses and a, and a couple thousand minor ones, you know, I'm sorry. You know, if we gave everybody that got that vaccine a shrimp, just one shrimp, to that same 6.7 million um, people. You know how many severe allergic reactions we'd have? Somewhere between about 33,000 and 168,000 because the, the rate of shellfish allergy in the population is between 0.5 and 2.5%. So the rate of reaction to this, the vaccine is very, very low. And I know at this point, like well over 100 people have got it. And, you know, other than sore arms and a little bit of headache and malaise, no one's really complained and nobody's missed a day of work. And so I think that um, you can be reassured. And by the time the majority of Americans are going to be eligible to get the vaccine, you're going to have, you know, millions and millions of people who have gotten it before you. Not only that, you know, there's never really been a vaccine side effect that hasn't shown up within about two months of the vaccine being given. And remember, the first doses of this vaccine were given in July, so it's been six months and we haven't really identified anything. Um, and that mRNA vaccine is such, it's so short lived. So that's another thing we can kind of debunk right away. Um, uh, she said it contains aborted baby cells. Well, that's not true. It's, it's mRNA. It's, it's not, there's no aborted baby tissue in the vaccines that you're getting. She said it contains dead animal cells. Well, it, there's no dead animals in it either. Um, it, it, and then the, the other thing was it doesn't prevent COVID. Well, it, it certainly does prevent COVID. Both the Pfizer and Moderna trials showed that it was 95% effective in preventing COVID. And not only that, for the majority of the people that, that it wasn't effective, of in, wasn't effective in preventing COVID, it kept the people from developing severe symptoms. And remember, like you can get COVID 
and have real big problems for a long time. So I, I, we're taking care of more and more post-COVID patients in my clinic. And there are people that get a fairly moderate to severe case of COVID. They don't die, they don't end up in the hospital, but they end up having brain fog, lung problems, heart problems, all kinds of things for months and months afterwards. And so if you can avoid that, I would highly suggest that to avoid it. Um, she said the PCR test is fraudulent because it, you know, it amplifies, you know, it's, it's, it, it amplifies DNA. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is designed to take a very, very tiny sample of something and then make multiple copies of it so that you can get enough that you can detect it. So PCR is a well-established uh, technology. The tests are, you know, they're not perfect, but they're, they're good and they're not fraudulent by any means. Um, she says the death rate in the country is only a couple thousand. Well, it's 350,000. I'm sorry. That's what it is. It's probably higher than that. I've seen it myself. People are dying from this. And if you don't believe that, I don't, your, your head's in the clouds. This is a serious problem. And a lot of people have died from this, vi this virus. Um, she kind of alluded to Dolores Clayhill, who, who, who's this sort of disgraced microbiologist from England who basically as early as November said there's no such thing as a pandemic and that um, the fatality rates no higher than influenza and that's you know you just go search there's there's 20 papers that that show that it's that's not the case um, she also says that most hospitals are empty well you know what they're not look in the paper look in you know look in California, look in Florida, look in New York, look here. I mean, this is, I'm, I don't work at a, a ginormous, you know, tertiary care hospital. I work at a, at, at a you know, a mid-sized hospital, a couple hundred beds. Um, and every hospital I know of, every doctor, every emergency doctor and critical care doctor I know of is telling me the same thing. Everybody is getting overwhelmed. So if you don't think that your hospital or you're being told your hospital is not full, I, you know what, go volunteer, go, go offer to volunteer. And I think you'll quickly be disabused of that notion. Um, again, uh, tired, I am probably being a little punchy about this whole thing, but and I realize that other people may have those, those issues. And so those are the are kind of the, the main debunking I'm going to do today. Tomorrow I'll, I'll try to be a little bit more constructive. I am a little tired. I'm going to call it quits for the day. I will be back tomorrow with another update. As usual, everybody, wash your hands, wear your mask, look after yourselves, look after those around you, and look after your families. We're going to have a, a rough couple months coming up. Do everything you can, especially for the next three months, to protect yourselves and your families. And we will get through this. We'll get the vaccinations going. And between that and the you know, ever-expanding number of people that actually get it, we are either going to vaccinate or infect our way to herd immunity, hopefully um, by the summer. Uh, stay safe. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Good night.